Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by Duo. While remote work has been on the rise for years now, the recent rapid expansion of work-from-home culture presents new security challenges. It's Duo's mission to make application access more secure for organizations of all sizes. Duo's modern access security is designed to safeguard all users, devices, and applications so you can stay focused on what you do best. Give your organization the peace of mind that only complete device visibility can bring. Visit duo.sc slash cyberwire to sign up for a free 30-day trial. And we thank Duo for sponsoring our show. India continues to investigate the possibility of Red Echo's cyber sabotage of its power distribution system, but says any hack was stopped and contained. Microsoft issues an out-of-band patch against a Chinese-run Operation Exchange Marauder. The financial sector works to contain an Ernsniff outbreak. CISA issues ICS security advisories. Myanmar and the difficulty of stopping cyber proliferation. Joe Kerrigan looks at C-name cloaking. Our guest is author Neil Deswani from Stanford University's Advanced Security Certification Program on his upcoming book, Big Breaches, Cybersecurity Lessons for Everyone. And another round in the crypto wars seems ready to start. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. Indian authorities continue their investigation of the possibility that the Chinese threat actor Recorded Future calls Red Echo compromised portions of the country's power grid. Inquiries are in progress, at least, in Maharashtra, according to India Today, and Telangana reports Business Today. Business Today adds that signs of malware were found in some 40 substations. There may have been attempts at command and control communication from the Chinese-based threat actor trying to access power distribution systems operated by the Telangana State Load Dispatch Center and TS Transco. CERT-IN, the Computer Emergency Response Team of India, advised both organizations to take appropriate precautions against those attempts. Telangana Today says that utilities have taken various measures to reduce the possibility of cyber attack, including blocking risky IP addresses, changing operator credentials, and isolating equipment suspected of having been compromised. India's Union Power Ministry confirmed to the Hindu that it had received warnings of the Red Echo operation and its possible use of shadow pad malware, but that prompt action had prevented a data incident. According to the ministry, such attacks failed. Quote, there is no impact on any of the functionalities carried out by the Power Sector Operations Corporation due to the referred threat. No data breach, data loss has been detected due to these incidents. As the Hindu notes, the statement made no explicit mention of the power outage in Mumbai on October 12, 2020. The reference to data breaches and data loss and their prevention also leaves aside discussion of the sort of sabotage the New York Times discussed in its coverage earlier this week. Microsoft warned late yesterday that the Chinese state-directed threat actor Hafnium was actively exploiting four zero days in on-premises Microsoft Exchange Server 2013, 2016, and 2019. Redmond has issued out-of-band patches for all four vulnerabilities, and it urges users to apply them immediately. Hafnium is a cyber espionage group active mostly against organizations in the U.S., especially infectious disease researchers, law firms, higher education institutions, defense contractors, policy think tanks, and NGOs. While based in and directed from China, Hafnium operates for the most part from leased virtual private servers in the U.S. Microsoft offers its attribution with high confidence and says it's based on observed victimology tactics and procedures, 
The company characterizes Hafnium as a highly skilled and sophisticated actor. The description of Hafnium's operation suggests that it represents a cyber espionage actor. Microsoft stresses that this campaign and the actor behind it are completely unrelated to the recent SolarWinds supply chain compromise. Redmond credited security firms Dubex and Veloxity with helping identify the exploitation. Veloxity dates the onset of the campaign, which it calls Operation Exchange Marauder, to January 6th at least. Prague-based security company Avast has obtained information on victims of the venerable Ersniff malware and has reached out to payment processors, banks, and financial services information sharing groups to help facilitate remediation. Ersniff came to Defender's attention in 2007 when it surfaced as a banking trojan. It's evolved since then to encompass other capabilities and new uses. Avast has located credentials, pay card, and banking information the Ersniff operators appear to have taken from victims during recent criminal activity. And the firm is sharing that information with organizations in a position to notify and assist the victims. Much recent Ersniff activity has targeted Italy. Avast says it's seen evidence that more than 100 Italian banks were affected, and so one of the company's key partners is CERT Fin Italy. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency yesterday issued three more ICS security advisories, the latest cover products by MB, Rockwell, and Hitachi. The New York Times reviews cyber proliferation to Myanmar's junta. The report indicates the perennial difficulty of restricting the spread of dual-use technologies, that is, not only tech that has entirely legitimate civilian uses, but technology that has lawful military and law enforcement uses, but which should be kept away from governments likely to use it for illicit repression. Singled out for particular mention are field units produced by the Swedish firm MSAB that can download the contents of mobile devices and recover deleted items, and Macquisition forensic software that extracts data from Apple devices. Macquisition is made by Black Bag Technologies, a U.S. company that was acquired late last year by Israel's Celebrite. Both companies say the tech in question appears to represent legacy systems and that they had suspended sales to Myanmar before this year's coup. Some of the tools may have been provided by various middlemen. The report in The Times might be considered a useful case study of the sort of problem the Atlantic Council addressed in its report on initial access brokers and cyber proliferation earlier this week. And finally, familiar lines appear to have been redrawn in Washington for a coming engagement in the crypto wars. The Washington Post reports that FBI Director Ray has mentioned the difficulty of adequately tracking domestic extremists when such extremists are able to avail themselves of end-to-end encryption. The opposing side says this misses the point and that weakening encryption will only serve, ultimately, to weaken security generally. As one expert put it, in the old days when you had a legal wiretap on the mob, sometimes the mobsters whispered and played a loud radio in the background. You can't always get what you want. And now, a word from our sponsor, ExtraHop, securing modern business with cloud-native network detection and response. The massive shift to remote work has turned the reality of work on its head. With cloud and multi-cloud adoption, comprehensive visibility is more important than ever. But in order to protect your business, you need more than unified visibility. You need intelligence response workflows so teams can collaborate easily and act quickly. ExtraHop helps organizations like Wizards of the Coast detect threats up to 95% faster. As John Kreese, senior IT engineer, puts it, quote, ExtraHop is helping us accelerate cloud adoption by ensuring our workloads are secure. See how it works in the full product demo, free and no forms required, at extrahop.com slash cyber. That's extrahop.com slash cyber. And we thank ExtraHop for sponsoring our show.
Neil Deswani is co-director of Stanford University's Advanced Security Certification Program, and he's author of the new book Big Breaches, Cybersecurity Lessons for Everyone. We caught up recently to discuss his new book. One of the reasons that I wrote this book is because I've been studying some of the biggest breaches that have been taking place uh, for the past seven years. Uh, I started studying um, these big breaches even before I became a chief information security officer for LifeLock uh, quite a while back. And I also spent time just uh, trying to understand, do, do some core research as to what are what are the root causes of all of these uh, data breaches so that we can get a handle on them and hopefully do a better job at preventing them in the future. Well, let's go through it together. I mean, what are some of their, are there common things that, that your research has, uh, has brought to bear here when it comes to the big ones? Yes, absolutely. So uh, in the Big Breaches book, well, I go back to 2013 and start with telling the histories and stories behind the breaches at uh, Target, J.P. Morgan Chase, OPM, Yahoo, Equifax, Capital One, and all of the mega breaches pretty much have similar root causes. Chief information security officers have hundreds of, I'd say, security compliance check boxes that they need to check, but there's really six things that these breaches come down to. And they are phishing, malware, software vulnerabilities, unencrypted data, third-party compromise and abuse, and inadvertent employee mistakes. If you're an organization that wants to defend yourself against a breach, I'd focus on those six things first, and you'll overwhelmingly reduce your susceptibility to being breached much more effectively than, you know, trying to check a whole bunch of checkboxes. Well, so what are the the take-homes for you? What do you hope people get out of reading the book? Well, I hope that most of the security professionals and chief security officers take away that if they focus on the six key technical root causes of breaches, they can make a significant advancement in mitigating their risk due to a breach uh, in an environment where if you look at an average organization, they might have to satisfy PCI compliance standards to take credit cards. They might have to satisfy HIPAA if they're a healthcare organization. They might have to satisfy FedRAMP if they do organization with the government. And each of these security compliance standards has hundreds of checkboxes. And so there's a a saying that... um, Complexity is typically the enemy of security. And if we simplify and focus on the six key technical root causes that have been at the heart of so many, so many breaches, I think we can be a lot more focused in our cybersecurity defense and hopefully prevent more breaches in the future. That's author Neil Deswani. The book is titled Big Breaches, Cybersecurity Lessons for Everyone. And now a message from our sponsor, Cyber Reason. If you're a defender fighting to protect your organization from the dark forces of cyber attackers, it might seem attackers have the advantage. To win, they only need to be successful once. As a cyber defender, you must be successful in ending attacks every single time. Cyber Reason reverses the attacker's advantage. They put the power back in your hands. Their future-ready attack platform gives defenders the wisdom to uncover, understand, and piece together multiple threats. And the precision focus to end cyber attacks instantly on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. Wherever your organization's data is being threatened, Cyber Reason is ready to win the battle against cyber attacks. With you and for you. Join them and the world's leading companies. Together, we are the defenders. Cyber Reason. End cyber attacks. From endpoints to everywhere. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Cyber Reason for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute and also my co-host over on the Hacking Humans podcast. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. 
There's an interesting story uh, from the Hacker News. Uh, it's titled, uh, Online Trackers Increasingly Switching to Invasive C-Name Cloaking Technique. Uh, what's going on here, Joe? Well, it's it's a result of most of the browsers saying, we're going to block third-party cookies, mm. right? So you can put third-party cookies into, uh, into web pages by putting uh, other URLs and requesting resources from them in your code. But that's pretty easy to block, right? I can just say, hey, the uh, user is going to this domain uh, and they want to, this this domain wants to load some resource from another domain. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're not mm. going to load that other resource. We're not even going to request it. Uh, right. We're just going to ignore it. And because that is impacting advertising dollars, uh, of course, now you have a very strong financial incentive to find a way around it. And a few advertising networks looks like they have found a way around it using something called CNAME cloaking. Hmm. So a CNAME or canonical name DNS entry is a DNS entry that points to another DNS entry. It's a domain name that points to another one. And this is very common. It's, it's absolutely required for the operation of the internet and the web. Uh, say, for example, you have a domain, DaveBittner.com, yeah. uh, but you don't want to set up your own web server and everything. You want someone else to host that for you. So mm -hmm. you go to some service provider and they give you a domain that's DaveBittner.ServiceProvider.com, mm. right? And you could tell everybody, hey, go to DaveBittner.ServiceProvider.com, but that seems kind of lame, Right. <laughs> Wouldn't right, you rather right. just tell them go to DaveBittner.com? Absolutely. So you, you, you make a CNAME <laughs> entry that 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 is DaveBittner.com that points to DaveBittner.ServiceProvider.com. And uh, that's how it works. Okay. The problem is this also works for cookies, <laughs> right? Uh, hmm. Because DNS happens outside of the web browser. So when these advertisers get in bed with the website, they say – Okay, so website, you're going to have a domain called uh, whatever.website.com, uh, and that domain is going to have a CNAME entry that points to our advertising uh, network.com. So the browser sees that as a, uh, as, as a URL that matches the domain that the user is visiting, and they go ahead and ask DNS for the IP address, and DNS does all the hopping around and returns just the IP address. Hmm. Right. And it goes out and requests the resource and it's going to the advertiser's servers, but the web browser doesn't know that it's going to an advertiser server. Hmm. So it's essentially making a third party cookie look like a first party cookie. Exactly. Yep. From from the uh, from the browser perspective, it does exactly that. Huh. So, okay, so we're playing this game of cat and mouse right. with these advertisers and these trackers. I mean, where do we stand in terms of blocking this sort of thing? Uh, right now, it's it's kind of hard to block these because uh, there there are some mitigations that, they're, that are available. Also, Firefox is, is rolling out something called total cookie protection that prevents cross-site tracking by confining all cookies from each domain into its separate cookie jar, they're calling it. I think that's very cute. <laughs> See, it sounds like something that Kermit the Frog used on Sesame Street to protect against Cookie Monster. But. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Apple's iOS 14 and uh, the Mac OS have come out with additional safeguards to build upon their existing features to shield third-party CNAME cloaking. I, that's, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I don't know how they're doing it. I don't know what the technical, uh, the technical back end is, but I imagine that within the web browser, they might build some kind of DNS engine that says, where does this resolve to? Does this resolve to a third-party domain? Okay, shut it down. Mm-hmm. But then mm -hmm. they have to, you know, that means they have to update the code. And now the uh, now now the browser is actually doing more, uh, you know, things that would it should be offloading to DNS, but it's actually having to resolve it first because of this tactic. You know, that's just going to make things more inefficient. It's going to yeah. make your computers, you know, I don't know if it's going to make them run slower given how fast everything is now, but it, it is unnecessary uh, operations. Right, right. This uh, this is why we can't have nice things. Right, exactly. Uh, the, <laughs> this article at Hacker News points out that uh, Chrome and, and by extension Chromium based browsers uh, are not they they are the oh, they are they are the browser that are not blocking CNAME cloaking natively. Like right, well they're <laughs> they're still not blocking third party trackers uh, natively. They they've reluctantly agreed that they're going to come along on this. Mm -hmm. um, but 
the reason is because Chrome is built by Google. Right. And a huge part of their revenue comes from advertising, from their advertising network. They're one right. of the biggest, if not the biggest, advertising network out there. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's they sort don't of have an interest. Self interest. In, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a conflict of interest here. Right. Right. All right. Well, this is uh, an interesting uh, article uh, again over on Hacker News. Some some neat uh, technical details there. Uh, thank you for helping us understand it, Joe Kerrigan. It's my pleasure, Dave. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. And for professionals and cybersecurity leaders who want to stay abreast of this rapidly evolving field, sign up for CyberWire Pro. It'll save you time and keep you informed. The special snack that makes ordinary occasions special. Listen for us on your Alexa smart speaker, too. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell. John Petrick, Jennifer Ivan, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Pittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Tomorrow.